Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Accelerate the Machine Learning Lifecycle with Unravel Data and Databricks. I'm Miguel Mendez, Marketing Specialist here at Unravel Data. And today we are joined by Craig Wiley, Senior Director of Product Management for Databricks, and Chris Santiago, Vice President of Solutions Engineering for Unravel Data. Together, they'll discuss how to increase reliability and efficiency with data observability and Databricks model serving. Before I pass it over to Craig, here are three housekeeping reminders. The first is throughout the webinar, please drop your questions into the question box and we'll do our best to answer them live or respond via email if we're short on time. If you submit one of the top 10 questions during this event as ranked by our fantastic panelists, you'll learn some cool Unravel swag. Additionally, this webinar will be available instantly on demand to listen to at your leisure. So feel free to pause or replay as needed. And lastly, please help us improve. Share your feedback on the session by rating this webinar and let us know if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about. With the reminders out of the way, the floor is all yours, Craig. Thanks. I'm Craig, and I'm excited to talk to you today about enabling production ML at scale with the Lakehouse. Here at Databricks, this is something we're constantly working with customers on, and excited today to share with you some of our perspectives on this challenge. New ML technologies are everywhere in the headlines right now, it would seem. ML is really going through a renaissance moment as folks understand really the transformational power of this technology. Right, whether it's chat GPT, whether it's mid-journey, whether it's self-driving cars, generative AI, and other high ca highly capable AI modeling uh, use cases are really capturing the, the attention of folks and helping them understand just some of the ways that this technology is really going to transform all of our lives. While these are exciting, you know, use cases and exciting examples, it's important to remember that the vast majority of ML kind of exists beneath this layer, right? And already companies have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of models in production, helping them with things such as fraud detection, demand forecasting, ad targeting, you know, or risk assessment or churn prediction. All of these are ways in which we've seen and helped organizations build out their ML capabilities. And a lot of these models, again, already in production are already creating value for the companies that have built them and deployed them. We've worked with kind of thousands of customers on how they can best move their machine learning from a, a science project they may be working on to a real, uh, significant part of their value proposition, either their revenue generation or their backend cost ma management and efficiency uh, development. We'll talk a little bit more about how this is all taken, how this all takes place. I often start with what I think what I think about as the ML maturity curve. Now, when we think about the ML maturity curve, it usually starts with this getting started phase where we often engage with customers. And often this looks, you know, they have a team of data scientists and machine learning engineers very focused on how they can build a better model and how they can deploy that model successfully and other key capabilities of this type. Now, not only is it a small dedicated team, but often they're using kind of traditional models, regression, decision trees, or other kind of what we call classical machine learning techniques. Maybe they're starting to dip their toes into some deep learning capabilities as well. From there, deployments are often batch oriented or offline deployments. Very often the model is run on a set of data and then those values are either kept in a database for looking up in real time or even just used for decision support or other kind of human in the loop type of capabilities. And then finally, the infrastructure at this getting started phase is often bespoke for each model and often requires quite a bit of custom engineering, taking you know, days or even weeks to often deploy these models. And you can see here kind of you know, dedicated teams using traditional, often offline methods with bespoke, cap bespoke infrastructure and engineering required for deployment. Now, we compare that to what we call the production phase, 
where in production, in the production phase, you're no longer limited to a series of de dedicated data scientists and ML engineers. And you're no longer limited to kind of classical types of models. Maybe you're working with deep learning or large language models or other foundational models to improve accuracy and the variety of use cases you can go after. And the use cases are not necessarily batch oriented. That often these models are built into production systems with, with advanced closed loop systems, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. And then finally, if you're going to be deploying tens or hundreds or even thousands of models, they can't be locked behind bespoke infrastructure for each model that takes significant time to get up and running. It has to be quickly and easily reusable infrastructure. This we think of as really this ML maturity journey that companies go through from kind of this getting started phase all the way up into a place where you know, more or less anyone could quickly and easily deploy a very high value model into an environment, into a consistent environment that they know will work the way they need it to. Now, we've seen this with companies. We've, we've lived through this, this transformation with companies. For example, Amgen, a pharmaceutical company with more than 200 data science projects on Databricks, who uses Databricks to help them with drug discovery and to optimize their clinical trials. We're excited to work with Amgen, and we're excited by the fact that some of the work they've done on Databricks has led to treatments that are already in testing, and we can't wait to see how they continue to use it in the future. Riot Games, for example, an online gaming platform with more than 100 million players, you know, whether it's uh, recommending the next best uh, challenge to give you in a game or, or an ad they may want to serve in the game or various backend efficiency uh, changes they, wanna, they may want to make in order to operate more effectively. All of these are different ways in which a company like Riot might choose to utilize ML at massive scale. And then a company you may not have heard as much about, Kona, Kona is a company that helps manage Coca-Cola's supply distribution and supply chains, building supply chain optimization models to help them manage the delivery and inventory levels across hundreds of thousands of stores, ensuring that the supply chain runs as optimally as possible and that the in-stock levels remain as needed across all of those stores. We're really excited to work with these companies and others not only on their AI maturity journey, but also on ensuring that they have best in class infrastructure and uh, model building capabilities to ensure that they can achieve any outcomes they're looking to with ML. So let's go back and talk a little bit about the machine learning workflow. It really starts with identifying and preparing your data sets. I've sat in many meetings where folks will dream up all of the amazing things they might do with machine learning without asking themselves, what data do I have at hand that I could most easily leverage to solve these problems? Identifying and preparing that data is critical. From there, they need to featureize that data or prepare it for, for use in ML. You could imagine with someone like Kona, they may have the address of all the stores, but the address isn't actually what's important to them. What might be important is the distance between that address and their distribution center. So for example, creating a feature of the address to the distribution center might be a great way to featureize that address data. Now you can think about doing this across the whole data set and all of the different data capable, all of the different data points and whether or not they would need to be featureized. From there, we build and try out different model architectures, different model types to really ensure that we've got the best fit and the most predictive power in our model. Ultimately, we then want to deploy our model to production and make it so that we can use that model at scale as frequently as is needed to, to make it so that we can gain as much value from the model as possible. Now, these models, that not only do the models kind of, can they decay over time or the data that feeds them or the behavior that they're, that, they're you, that they're seeking to mirror may change or evolve over time. In that case, you also need to monitor these models, 
tune the models and continually retrain them to make sure they're always at their maximum level of accuracy so that they're always providing as much value as possible. This we could talk about as this closed loop. Once we've got that model in production, we're watching and monitoring it, and should it ever start to not produce the values that were as strong as we've seen before, we can go back to the beginning, go collect more data, train, retrain the model, bring it back into production, and keep that loop going. If we think about the principles of production ML, no longer the challenge of building a model, but of really getting to a point where your organization can use this technology at massive scale, we see that there are three things that need to be true. The first is you can't have any manual processes in this. You know, if all of your data is locked behind a single human who folks have to go talk to in order to get to that data, then, you know, if everyone wants to build models, that person's going to become a bottleneck. Any process in the entire workflow that has kind of, you know, a, can become a bottleneck if it's not well enough, uh, you know, if it's not well enough built and well enough operated. And so what we want to do is make sure that we eliminate as many of those manual processes as we can so that we can ensure that everyone, anyone and everyone can quickly and easily go do what is necessary to build these models. Second of all, these capabilities have to be usable by mere mortals. Bespoke systems or, or custom separate tooling to do something, some specific step, all make it much, much harder for, for more and more people to be able to access this. What we want to make sure is that the data is available, the tooling for building and deploying the models is broadly available, and that all of these can scale as our business's needs and requirements scale. And finally, built-in auditing and governance. Many of us have invested significantly in ensuring that our data is well governed, is well audited, is well secured. It's critical that in machine learning, we continue doing that as well. These derived assets or these models we create really are part of our data. And we need to make sure that whatever rules apply to our data governance also apply to our model governance. All of this requires a mature ML platform that's deeply integrated with the data and the deployment architecture in your company. And only when that's true, can you really get to a point where you can do you know, massive production of ML at scale. So let's talk a little bit about how we think about those problems. So first of all, we talked about identifying and preparing data sets and preparing and featurizing that data. So to help you identify and prepare data sets, Databricks provides a global table and feature catalog with our Unity catalog. This gives full visibility to folks to see the tables they have the access permissions to see and for them to understand things like the quality, the lineage, the popularity. Hey, is this a table that's been used before? Or is this, a, it, maybe it's even a table that's been used for machine learning before. Is this a table I can count on? Is it a table I can trust? Does the column in this table, if I trace back the lineage, is it actually what I'm looking for or is it something different? All of these are quickly and easily understood in Databricks and the Unity catalog. And then ultimately, a world-class platform for data and feature engineering. At Databricks, we've been investing for years in a world-class uh, data manipulation environment. Our notebooks, our catalog with its lineage, quality, and popularity measures give the data scientists everything they need to, to be able to quickly dive in manipulate this data and start preparing it for model training. From there, we need to build out different models to really try and figure out how we can best model or mimic the behaviors we're trying to, to model or, or influence. And so here, you know, increasingly what I'm seeing is folks are more and more using AutoML to just simply build the model for them, saves time and is often more accurate even than then uh, you know, it might be doing it by hand. Or with Databricks, our AutoML 
not only does it build a model, but it gives you all the code for that model. So maybe you start with AutoML and then take that code and use it for your own needs or, or turn it into the model you wanted in particular. Next, customers are increasingly up-training models. We, we hear about up-training large language models or fine-tuning foundational models. This is taking a larger model maybe that you've built or maybe that's open source, applying some of your data so that you get the, the value not only of your data building a model, but you also get all of the rich uh, model, all of the rich information already captured in that foundational model. And then, of course, we provide best in class experimentation for the do it yourself or the, the folks who want to really start from a blinking cursor with our managed ML flow capabilities, as well as a training environment with popular libraries and GPU hardware, the kind of the data scientist who wants to roll up their sleeves and code their own model has everything they need on Databricks to do just that. Now, once we've got that model built, now we wanna get it into production. And I'm sure many of you have seen Databricks recently launched model serving into GA. Model serving allows folks to take their model they've built and with one click, put it behind a real-time, highly scalable serving endpoint. These endpoints are designed for low latency and, as I said, high scalability to ensure that you're always able to meet the traffic you need to meet as you deploy this model ultimately into your production system. With a simple API call, uh, system, you know, your production systems can get back the inferences they need from your model to optimize your production systems. Now, not only is it quick and easy to get a model up there, but it's fast auto scaling with scale to zero. So if you're not using your model at the time, we pull that hardware down and you no longer pay for the model at that point. And then when the when traffic starts coming in, we will auto scale the hardware back up to meet those needs. And finally, production grade capabilities, a high SLA, traffic splitting progress, a B testing capability, uh, or so, sorry, traffic splitting for progressive rollouts, as well as A B testing to be able to make sure that your newly trained model meets the business logic or the previous model that may have been in place. And then in preview, we have our monitoring capabilities, a self service, self service monitoring for every model you have giving you automated dashboards with all the key metrics and recommended improvements for the model's accuracy. Holistic monitoring, not only of the model, but of, lineage, of the lineage as well. So that we can make sure that if the model's not behaving the way we expect it to, we can see upstream what data might be influencing that change. And then extending your, not only can you do all of these things, but you can actually extend the monitor to join your model to other business metrics or ground truth data for the model so that you can monitor not only the technical performance of the model, but whether or not it's doing what you want it to. Is it driving the business impact you expect it to? Is it actually accurate in predicting these outcomes and results, giving you the power not only to monitor it, but to do some ad hoc analysis to ensure the model's uh, operating at the absolute maximum level of accuracy across all of your important segments. So really excited to join all of you today and talk to you a little bit about how Databricks sees all of this working and how Databricks understands how Databricks helps customers move through that ML maturity curve and really helps them build, deploy, and monitor their models in production. Now, to talk a little bit more about this, I'm gonna give it back to the folks at Unravel to dive in to see how Databricks plus Unravel can create even more differentiated outcomes. Have a good day, thank you. Thanks, Craig, for the awesome presentation. But before we move on, we've gotten a few questions for you in the chat box. The first question is, are cloud compute and storage costs included in Databricks units, DBUs? No, Databricks units or DBUs as we often call them, are kind of reference units used by Databricks uh, to price and compare data workloads across our uh, platform. DBU consumption depends on the underlying compute resources and the data volumes processed. Uh, cloud resources such as compute instances and cloud storage are priced separately. 
Uh, Databricks pricing is available for uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and uh, GCP or, or Google Cloud. And you can estimate costs online for Databricks on all three of the clouds, and then add estimated cloud compute and storage costs with the uh, AWS, Azure, or Google uh, Databricks pricing calculators. So we've got a calculator to help you out, but really uh, DBUs or the Databricks units are just a small premium paid on top of the cost of the infrastructure. The second question is, how can I ensure high quality data in my lake house? Well, you can certainly run queries or monitoring jobs to ensure that your data uh, looks and uh, is acting the way you expect it to. Delta Live Tables also offers uh, exceptions, as it's called. And exceptions are an, opt op an optional clause that uh, you include with your Delta Live Tables that declares uh, certain data quality uh, checks. And if uh, your records pass those checks, then the record is written. And if not, you can choose what you want to do. Do you want to quarantine the record? Do you want to fail the job? Do you want to sideline uh, the record? Kind of up to you. Uh, but Unravel adds some, some interesting additional capabilities. So the third question that I have here is, how is Databricks model serving different from cloud native solutions? Databricks model serving is it's a lot simpler than most of the cloud uh, solutions out there. Requires uh, far fewer kind of knobs and dials when putting your model into production. You basically tell us how much concurrent traffic you're going to get, and that's about it. Um, from there, we take care of everything else. We scale the model up and down. We scale to zero as needed. Uh, you know, so you don't have to pay for hardware you're not using. And so really it just simplifies the experience uh, of deploying a model and running that model in production. Thank you, Craig. Next up is Chris Santiago. Thank you for joining us today, Chris. Hi, and thank you for giving me the opportunity here to talk about this great subject about data observability. My name is Chris Santiago, and I'm the VP of Solutions Engineering at a company called Unravel Data. For those who don't know, Unravel Data is a data ops observability platform purposely built for modern data stacks like Databricks. Um, more specifically, our support for Databricks is extended to AWS and Azure Databricks. And really, we simplify the challenge of data operations, improve performance, save critical engineering time, and optimize resource utilization. Now, let's talk about the subject at hand. Machine learning enables organizations to extract more value from their data than ever before. Companies who successfully deploy ML models into production are able to leverage that data value at a faster pace than ever before. But deploying ML models requires a number of key steps, each fraught with challenges. What I'm going to do next is walk you through a day in the life of a data scientist. Um, also taking into account data engineers that are trying to productionalize this from an MLOps perspective, all the way up to folks that are tracking costs and an ROI. How can we all make these teams work together so that way they're productive and really focusing in on providing performance, cost, and quality through the use of Databricks for their organizations today? Tell me if this sounds familiar. As a data scientist, you have many source tables that you need to join together and make some transformations to go ahead to train your models. Problem is your transformations are starting to take a very long time and you're unsure in your one notebook, which of the 100 queries that you have in there are the ones that are actually causing the biggest drain to your performance. Nobody has time to go into the Databricks console and try to look at things such as logs, or Spark UI to really try to figure this out. You just want to know this quickly. Where's my bottleneck? And then what can I do next to resolve it? Well, you're in luck. Because right now, what I'm going to show you is how life can be like if you're using a platform that was built for data observability on Databricks. What you're seeing here right now is I'm on this compute tab, which shows me a list of my clusters. And in this clusters, I can go ahead and drill right into my Spark job here. Now I can come in here and look at things such as resources at the cluster level. 
I can go and look at if there were errors that I may want to consider in this particular case. I can go ahead and even look at the queries that were actually being thrown in this particular example. So I can see the types of queries that were actually being run here. But right now, I really need to solve my performance challenges here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into this analysis tab. And what you're seeing here right now is Unravel's Insights and Recommendations AI-driven engine that's going, ahead, it's going to go ahead and actually give you a root cause analysis or other things that you can do to make this job perform even better. And so we're going to really focus in on this bottlenecks uh, insight here. And more specifically, what Unravel is telling me is that I actually have some bad joins in some of my queries in this notebook. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here, it looks like I have five queries that were flagged. But uh, for this purpose of this demo, I'm going to go ahead and look at just one of these queries. And here, it's actually telling me that I have an inefficient join in my uh, customer table. That's interesting. That is one of many queries in this notebook. So let's go ahead and dig in a little bit further. Now, if I go ahead and click on this stage eight here, I can look at things such as the timings of this particular query and where did most of my time get spent. I can see here a lot of CPU. I can also look at what was like the distribution of time of my tasks. So if I had any data skew, I can also see a timeline here so I can get a visual representation of how the tasks were performed at the executor level. In this case, I only have two. And each box that you see here is the tasks. And so I can see that there's something going on here. And so as a data scientist, really the only thing that I can control is the queries itself. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to click on this program tab. And so I did write this in Scala. So it's, uh, I wrote my Spark SQL in there. Um, and so what I can do here is I'll actually click on this inefficient join type. And it's going to actually take me to line 12 of my code and will actually give me the, the SQL query here itself. Now, what I'm going to do with this information is I know that there was an inefficient query that was joined here. Now I'm going to go ahead and actually change this, whether it's changing the group by key or um, maybe normalizing some of these tables, whatever it is. But what I've done here is I found that needle in the haystack and I've, I, and Unravel has identified where the inefficiencies are. And now I was able to correlate performance metrics down to the line of code very easy in one single interface. Think about how much time that you can save and more importantly, how much time you can use to actually create awesome models for your organization today. While building ML models is hard, deploying them into production is even more difficult. Data engineers are giving code, usually in notebooks loaded with packages and dependencies, yet expected to productionalize these pipelines in a timely manner. What's more challenging is that these teams don't know what the code is actually doing, yet they're still responsible if these pipelines do not meet their SLAs. There's a lot of finger pointing going on here, whether it's the code or if it's the network. Let me go ahead and show you what life could be like if we're using a data observability platform. So what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to go into this workflows tab. And I'm going to look at my jobs. So these are Databricks jobs, and I've got a series of them here. I know that I was having some issues with this last one here. So before I go ahead and click on this, I can actually start seeing things such as the duration over time, if there is any read write um, cost as well. Let's go ahead and look into this because I've been having some challenges here. And if I actually click in here, I can actually see the job runs in this Databricks jobs uh, environment. And I can start seeing that I see a bunch of failures here um, within my pipeline here. So what I'm going to do is actually, let's go ahead and select one of these runs here. So let's look at this last one here. And really, I'm just trying to understand why this keeps on failing most recently. And so in here, I can actually see this job run. I can see the configuration of this cluster. I can see the task here. So this task name, the high GC event. And if I go ahead and click on this spark button over here, takes me into that familiar view that we just saw. And we're, I'm just going to start here in this analysis tab. And here it is again, Unravel telling me what 
was going on in this particular case. And, and here it was actually some application failure due to out of memory. And so as this data engineer, what I can now do is actually have a good conversation with the data scientist and say, hey, you actually ran out of memory here. You, got, you need to go ahead and fix this problem. Here's the link to from Unravel and you can go ahead and start drilling in into Unravel itself and start looking at the reasons as to why this particular task run failed in this Databricks job. Very powerful stuff here. Last but not least, let's talk about cost. As cloud costs continue to rise, the burden to sticking to budgets is now starting to become the responsibility of the Databricks user base. The question is, of my team of data scientists, which one or a few are driving up the costs? And is there anything I can do to get in front of this issue before my boss gets surprised yet again with another huge cloud bill? Now, if you've been trying to solve this problem yourself, you're probably going to agree with me in the statement of saying that the out of the box tools are lacking. We don't have quite the granularity to be able to understand who's driving up the costs. But more importantly, we don't actually have this uh, information coming to us uh, in a timely manner. And in fact, it's usually batch processed. And when we come to find out that the cost is high for the month, it's already too late. So let me show you what life is like if we were actually going to try to solve this problem from within Unravel itself. And the way I'm going to start this off is by starting here in this cost tab. And right now we are looking at this chargeback view. And right now I'm, I'm grouping by workspace. So we have the ability to click to connect to multiple workspaces in an organization. So whether you have a development environment, staging environment, or however you're using workspaces, we can start to get that information here. And I detected that fraud detection was probably my biggest use case. And as the data shows here, I can actually see that fraud detection is actually reigning supreme, whether it's from a DBU consumption perspective or a cost perspective, or just the number of cluster sessions that are being run in this particular environment. Um, but, you know, let's actually get down to it. It's the user um, that I really want to drill into because that user could be using interactive clusters, job clusters. They could be using a bunch of services from within uh, Databricks itself. And so when I go ahead and select grouping by user here, I can now start to see that we do have a consistent user here. Uh, my V Sharma uh, user over here is starting to use up 50% of the DBUs, 54% uh, of the cost here, um, the number of cluster sessions as well. So just right out of the box, I get all this information. And the best part about this particular report is that this information is pulled into Unravel as soon as we see it, right? Uh, there's a couple of seconds delay, but we can start getting more real-time visibility um, and getting that snapshot. So uh, whether it's a team lead, whether it's the executive, um, they can start to see where their cloud costs are going in a Databricks perspective easily from within this particular view itself. Now, if you want to take it a step further, we do have some budget functionality here. And so in this budget tab, we can start to see, uh, we can go ahead and create budgets. And so you give it a name and description, the period, how long I want it to go for. I can set my scope. You know, I can go set up, uh, maybe set up another uh, budget for my V Sharma user here. Um, and I can start setting that budget here. And so I'll say 500 because last month uh, there was 455 and I want him to stick around that level. Actually better yet, let's, let's assume that we want him to go a little bit lower. Um, and then from there, I can actually take action, proactive action by setting up a notification channel, whether this be Slack or emails, I can go ahead and set that up and we can get alerted uh, as soon as that happens. So I can go ahead and save that. Um, but what I'm going to do for the purposes of this demo is just use some of these existing budgets here. And so uh, real quickly, we can see some colorful budget statuses here. And I'll walk you through what you're seeing here. Um, this first one here is a budget status of green. And essentially what that means is my finance budget here. Um, I budgeted 200 DBUs. And so far, we've only consumed uh, about four DBUs in this particular uh, budget. So based on the way things are going from a consumption standpoint, 
we're forecasting that we're going to become uh, under budget for this particular budget that we had set. Meanwhile, we have this um, this uh, DBX FG uh, budget that we had set. Um, we set it for our one DBU just so you know we can show uh, you know how much blown over this can be. And so obviously we've consumed about thirty nine DBUs here, and so we're way over budget, right? And uh, we've got emails that are being sent out from that perspective. So that's always not a good sign. Now let's talk about this third case here. So we've got this uh, this third budget here that's tracking in yellow, and the reason for that is right now we set that budget for fifty DBUs. But so far, we've accrued a cost of about 39 DBUs. Now, as we're looking at the, the time right now, so it's um, we're almost at the end of the month. And so we're by the how we're consuming resources, we are expected to forecast 53 DBUs um, at the end of the month, which obviously we will go over budget at that particular point in time. And so that's why it's a yellow. And what's really, really nice about what Unravel does here is, is as soon as these budgets change status, an email gets sent out, right? So instead of waiting for the end of the month to get that bill and get shocked and then get um, reprimanded from, you know, from other organizations that are tracking costs, let's actually go ahead and get alerted as soon as we're starting to get a little bit off the rails. And then more importantly, we can go ahead and even optimize and so if I click on this optimized tab here, we're back in that compute tab here. Um, we're looking at basically the same time window that we were looking at before. Uh, we must have set this at a, a global standpoint. And from that standpoint, we can do the same thing that we had shown earlier, where I can go into that Spark example, where I can go into that Spark example and look at things such as insights for efficiency. And in this particular case, I actually have a cost-effective instance recommendation that's available. And if I actually look at this, you can see that we are essentially saying that you overallocated your, your instances in this particular case. So I picked a 14 gig uh, VM where I could have gotten away with just using eight gigs. So I didn't need that extra gigs for that, right? Um, so from a uh, 51 cents down to 34 cents, um, that's about a 37% savings over time right and so all i need to do from a configuration standpoint is just make that configuration and i should make my slas that i was uh, expected to meet in this particular point in time but more importantly i'm actually doing it with less resources which in turn is doing it from a less cost perspective now this is powerful because if i go and look at, for example, all of those very similar recommendations where it was more from a cost perspective, I can now do a top-down approach and start looking at all of my jobs from within my Databricks organ or, uh, cluster, or I'm sorry, my Databricks workspaces and really start looking for the more problematic uh, jobs and clusters that were over-allocated. And now we can go ahead and make that, those changes Again, using data to tell us where the top offenders are and then making that simple change so that way we can get back in, on track with those budgets from yellow back into green. Very, very powerful stuff and um, you know, a great um, business value that Unravel provides for uh, the organization. Thank you, Chris. Our last segment is with Nick Palazze from Databricks. Thanks for joining. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick, and now that we've gotten the big picture of how the lake house brings production level scale to your machine learning, I'd like to walk you through an example on how a team might build a personalized recommendation system on Databricks. The natural place to start is with the most critical part of any machine learning project, the data. Since we're going to be building a recommendation system, first we have to identify and prepare the data we're going to use. Jumping into the data tab of our Databricks workspace, we can see that there are a bunch of catalogs on the left-hand side. To keep things simple, we set up an example Unity catalog named Production for our data, but this is where we would start our search for relevant, high-quality data. Within this catalog, we have three sets of data. Global application data that tells us how users are interacting with our system, so device and web data. Sales and vendor data that let us know what the outcomes are for the end user. And then user data that includes all the information gathered around user profiles. 
you can see that some of this data might be sensitive, such as personal user information. But fortunately for us, Unity Catalog gives us the ability to have granular controls on what data can be seen by machine learning engineers and what data will be hidden to the user, but still available for model training purposes. Unity Catalog not only helps you govern your data, but it also provides lineage for both your data and models, which helps you quickly pinpoint any data issues within your pipelines. Having all of your data in the lake house saves you from having to maintain, manage, and secure data across multiple data stacks. We can even go a step further and make sure that we're using the best data available by gaining insights into the quality and freshness of our data. This helps us make sure that we don't start building our system on stale, unmaintained, or low quality data. Serving users the most accurate recommendation is a constantly moving target. So in order to be as accurate as possible, the freshness of your data is critical. A successful recommendation system will be regularly adding new items and have a constant stream of data, such as user clicks and page interactions. In order to always be acting on the freshest data, the Lakehouse provides a very powerful framework for establishing ETL pipelines through Delta Live Tables, or DLT for short. DLT makes it easy to build and manage both batch and streaming pipelines that deliver high quality, fresh data to train your models. Fortunately for us, you can also write your feature engineering pipelines directly using DLT, which means that you get to use top tier data engineering tools to do your feature management. This means creating feature specs in just one place, again, with Unity Catalog providing governance. We can define pipelines using familiar notebooks and set them to run on a cadence or as constantly streaming tables. Once our features are created, we can always go into the feature store to search and reuse features that someone has made before, as well as understand what models and training pipelines they feed. Now that we have a handle on our data and how our features are being taken care of, let's take a brief look into how you can experiment and train models on the Lakehouse. Databricks notebooks make writing and writing code extremely simple. Having managed machine learning runtimes and personal compute available means that you can focus on the task at hand instead of fighting with the environment and compute setup. Here, we're showing a quick example of training a simple regression model that's going to predict how relevant a given item is for a user's search terms. This will be crucial to our recommendation engine as a high value should correlate to a strong recommendation. Thanks to MLflow being integrated, once the run completes, we can see the results of all training runs along with the relevant performance metrics. In this case, an R squared of 0.8, not too bad. But what if we could take a more hands-off approach? AutoML takes things even a step further and opens the door for developers to automatically train and tune models by just providing a data set and a few extra parameters. Here, we can also reference the feature tables that we created in our pipeline earlier to make sure that we get all the best data for our training. Not only does AutoML give you the trained models, but it also provides automatically generated notebooks to show the user exactly how that model was trained. This glass box approach puts the power in the developer's hands instead of hiding things behind the curtain. AutoML is also deeply integrated into the lake house, and now that we've used it to train a few models, those models are automatically tracked into our lake house recommendation experiment. It can be easily registered in preparation for deployment. If we compare our results, it looks like AutoML is able to generate a few models that were even better than our trained one, with an R squared of 0.94. So now we can take this model and register it into the model registry, which gives us the ability to track everything surrounding a model such as features, version control, comments, deployments, and more. Now, in order to make use of this shiny new model that we've trained, we have to deploy it so that our recommendation system can reap the benefits of the new, more accurate model. Typically, deploying models into production environment requires a dedicated team to build and maintain the serving infrastructure, not on the lake house. With the release of our newly improved model serving, you can easily and quickly deploy models into production without the traditional overhead of setting up infrastructure. With one click, you can deploy real-time models in a cost-effective and highly performant manner. These endpoints will not only scale to match your workload, but can scale all the way down to zero to save costs for intermittent use cases. You can also deploy two models behind the same endpoint. This lets you split traffic between deployed models in order to progressively roll out deployments and minimize risk, as well as do A-B testing to see which model performs better in production. This way, when we deploy our new model, we can make sure that it does indeed outperform the older one. 
All of this can be achieved as well through the REST API for integration into your CI CD tooling. Now, we know that deploying is just the start. So users are provided with built-in metrics and logs that can be used to monitor mo deployed models in production, as well as set alerts for when things might be going askew. This provides much needed visibility into the performance of models once they're live in production. This all leads us to our final step of our production machine learning journey, which is closing the loop and creating a unified platform that reacts based on your data. Lakehouse monitoring lets you unify and act on the entirety of your data by surfacing model inference and performance data as delta tables right alongside the rest of your business data. This means that if we see a sudden decrease in our customer checkout rate, we can reliably track the root cause back to a specific model deployment, or maybe even all the way back to some potential bad data source that we train our model on. This is only possible when you have a truly integrated machine learning and data platform. Many of our customers have already started down this path and have been reaping the benefits of the lake house as the future of machine learning. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Chris and Craig, for your expertise and insights. That's all the time we have for today. You'll receive the recording shortly along with these slides and additional resources which you can share with your colleagues or peers. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. If we didn't answer your question live today, we'll reach out via email. If you submitted one of the top 10 questions during this event, then we'll be in touch and you'll receive your swag soon after. And for any additional questions, you can always reach out to us at hello at unraveldata.com. Thank you and see you again soon.